Hello. This is Nelson Olmstead. The National Broadcasting Company presents Story for Tonight. Mankind has always enjoyed a good story. It was that way in the beginning when our ancestors gathered around campfires to hear accounts of adventure. Today we can enjoy the finest tales ever written, the result of thousands of years of experience. And we don't gather around the campfire, but around the radio. This evening, NBC presents the second in a new series of programs designed to bring to life for you the most compelling and dramatic modern short stories that have been written. Here is your teller of tales, Nelson Armstead. Well, thank you, Hugh Downs. In the New Testament, it is written, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh, in a story for tonight, there's a young boy who knows exactly what that means. Do you mean he gets into trouble? Oh, no, not exactly, Hugh, but he takes it plenty seriously. You see, he has an immense capacity for dreaming. And as a consequence, creates for himself a fantastic and glamorous life. I know how those dreams can be. Who wrote the story, Nelson? J. Roger Weitzel is the author. And under his hand, I think you'll agree, the story of our 14-year-old boy enmeshed in the calamitous and world-shaking problems of the adolescent becomes high comedy. It's entitled, Miracle Man. Stripped to the waist, he stood before the bedroom mirror, flexing his right arm, drawing his forearm toward the side of his head, until his fist nudged into the crook of his neck. The tendons of his spindly neck stood out from the strain of holding his arm in the cramped position, while with his left hand, he draped a tape measure over the stringy bicep. By craning his neck and popping his eyes, he was able to read the measurement before the tape began to slip. Nine and a half. Creepers. He didn't think it'd be that bad. The shock of it gave him a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach. He looked down again at the copy of Unbelievable Stories on the dresser. The advertisement on the back cover featured a full-length likeness of Professor Konak, most muscular man in America, heroically posed, powerfully contracted in every muscle, clad in a caveman costume of leopard skin. Opposite Professor Konak, in the upper left-hand corner of the page was a small photograph of a gruesomely emaciated man in a drooping pair of bathing trunks, scarcely able to stand for weakness and bad posture. A bold, fat arrow pointed at this picture from a loud caption that read, Do you look like this? Jeepers, did he look like that? He looked into the mirror again, stood at attention, and tried to throw out his chest. Nothing happened. He scrutinized his physique from several angles, none of which enhanced it any. Then he read the urgent italics under the thin man's picture. Are you puny, weak, run down, nervous, helpless? Do you have poor eyesight, bad breath, poor posture? Do you stand aside when the fellows get rough? Do you lack the manliness that attracts women, that gives them that protective feeling? Don't be discouraged. Professor Konak can help you. Feeling sick again, he looked in the mirror. He hadn't realized how bad off he was. Why, he could double for the guy in the picture. And the description fitted him in every detail. Except the eyesight. He could see all right. Right now, he could see a lot more than he wanted to. A nine and a half inch arm and a 28 inch chest creepers. Professor Konak's arm was 16 and a half and his chest 48. Wow. The coupon at the bottom of the page offered a big free booklet, fully illustrated, to explain the Konak system for health, super strength, and a magnetic personality, sent promptly without obligation. Let Konak make a man of you. Mail coupon today. He put on his sports shirt slowly while he made up his mind. This might be the thing he was looking for. He could just send in the coupon anyway and find out how Professor Konak did it, even if he never got the nerve or the money to go on with it. He 
He listened with a feeling of satisfaction as the tan envelope, of which he'd sneaked from his mother's box of stationery, slithered through the slot. He let the mailbox clank shut, checking again the pickup time in the box. He figured roughly that if they mailed the booklet right back, he should have it this time next week. He started homeward, facing the late afternoon sun with squinted eyes, not seeing the world about him, not thinking of himself as he was now, but of how he would be in the future. It would be a nice Sunday afternoon when groups of girls from school would be out walking in their best clothes, giggling, and calling to all the boys they knew. He'd be walking along, just as he was now, and he would meet the girls, and they would stop giggling and step aside respectfully, their eyes wide, sensing the magnetism and the power of him. And they would turn their heads to look after him long after he'd passed, whispering, Jeepers, where has he been all our lives? He would have a sweet revenge on Isabel Kinston for her scornful laughter that night on her back porch when he said, I love you. He would meet Isabel that Sunday afternoon, and he would have two girls with him, one in each arm. Senior girls, too. Maybe Marge Hennon and Patty Douglas. And they would have on their sheer stockings and high heels and makeup and silky dresses. And they would be hanging on to his arms, their brightly manicured fingers lingering over the great biceps that thickened and swelled with every movement of his arm, threatening to burst open the seams of his coat sleeves. And he would pass by Isabel Kinston without so much as a nod, gaily chatting first to Marge and then to Patty to keep them from calling over him right there in the street. And in that moment, Isabel Kinston would realize her loss. Crushed, broken, she would turn away with that horrible hurting inside her like he'd had that night on her back porch. She would run home, fingernails biting into the palms of her hands, tears welling in her eyes, and she would lock herself in her room and cry and cry and cry. And maybe she'd refuse to go to meals after that. She'd begin wasting away. The doctors would shake their heads hopelessly and say, There's no medicine to cure a broken heart. And then... One night, past midnight, the doorbell would ring at his house, and he would open the door to find a haggard, woebegone Mr. Kinston, a desperate, pleading Mr. Kinston. You've got to come, Elmer. She's been calling your name for days. She loves you, Elmer. Go to her. It's the only thing that can save her. He would go to her. They would hear with rejoicing his cat-like tread on the stairs. His magnetism would fill the room, and the great expanse of his shoulders would wall their beloved daughter from view as he knelt beside the bed to take her slim, feverish hand in his sinewy hand. A hand capable of ripping telephone directories asunder, of twisting decks of playing cards into confetti, of bending ten-penny nails into puzzles. But now, clothed in a velvet glove of tenderness, her hair would be a yellow flood on the pillow. Her pale lips would murmur his name. Her eyes would flutter open. Darling, you've come. Elmer, darling, hold me close. And right there in front of her mother and father and the doctors, he would slip his arm under her shoulders, raise her from the pillow, cradle her to him, and kiss her on the lips. Promise, darling, never let me go. I promise, Isabel, he would say. You're mine now and for always. Creepers. It made him have a lump in his throat thinking about it. Poor Isabel. It was beautiful. He felt almost like crying. <laughs> the shuddering screech of brake shattered his dream. He'd walked into the middle of the street and had nearly been run down by a burly man in a shabby blue sedan. The man stuck his angry face out of the window and bellowed, What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, Skinny? You smart aleck? You want to get killed? Why don't you look where you're going, huh? He felt very red in the face, too. He stuttered, but no words came. Two women standing on the sidewalk were laughing at him. He felt shaky and pale. His nerves were shot. He felt ashamed, mortified at being yelled at in the middle of the street, insulted right in the middle of the street. 
Those women laughing at him, it made him sick. Why did a thing like that have to happen now? Why, why couldn't it have happened later? But he would have been prepared for it. Why, he would have been as calm as anything. He would have walked around to the side of that jalopy, and he would have reached in the window and grabbed a fistful of that guy's shirt front, and he would have jerked him half out of that car until their noses met. And he would have given that big bum a cold, steely stare. And he would have said in a cold, steely voice, What's your trouble, mister? Don't you want to keep your good health? Don't you know it's impolite to shout at people? Sure. He would have said that. And when that big slob heard his voice, felt a vice-like grip on his shirt, he would have wilted down all right. Of course, there would have been a crowd gathering at the curb, and he would have elbowed his way through it, nodding his head curtly to those he knew. You did right, son. You give him just what he deserved. That's what the people would say. And some would ask others who he was, and the ones that knew him would say... Oh, don't you know? Why, that's Ace Mahennan. Or uh, maybe by then he'd be known as uh, Slug. Or maybe even Killer. He didn't know for sure what they'd be calling him, but it'd be something like that. And uh, Isabel would be in the crowd, too. Her eyes big, blue, and loving. And she would take his arm and walk down the street with him and apologize for laughing at him on the back porch that night. And he would say, You're my girl now, but exclusively... Just let anybody else try to date you and see what happens to him. Isabel would love it. Shucks, yes. That's the way it would have gone. He hung around the house all the next week waiting for the mailman, rereading Professor Konak's ad, and striking various poses before his mirror, trying to visualize how he was going to look with muscles. Wait until Mr. Carner, the public school coach, saw him when school opened in the fall. Just wait. Last year, he was too scrawny to be a water boy. But this year, why, he'd sit right there in the coach's office at the gym and, and joke with him man to man, the way the older boys did. Maybe he'd scare the coach for a while by letting him think he wasn't coming out for the team. He'd let the coach uh, coax him a little. Treefers, he'd probably be the football sensation of the year. High schools and colleges all over the country would be keeping their eye on him. He'd wind up being one of the greatest fullbacks of all time. He could see himself right now, like in a newsreel, snake hipping his way through a broken field, slamming straight arms around, plunging and driving through the center of the line, and the crowd taken with insanity as he spearheaded through for a touchdown. Maybe he'd get knocked out once in a while, and there would be time out while the trainer worked over him, and the coach chewed a cigar to shreds. Then... He would be up on his feet, pumping his knees up and down while the cheerleaders directed the stands in a rising cadence of Mahanan! 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 Shucks, yes! On Friday, it came. He took the manila envelope straight to his room and shut the door behind him. His hands trembled. His fingers fumbled and scraped at the flap. At last, he got a fingernail into it and ripped the whole side of the envelope. He spent the entire morning examining the physiques of the professor and his successful pupils. It was truly astounding what the professor had done for these beefy specimens, posed dramatically in brown tone, so that the muscles came lumping beautifully out of the shadows. Most of them, according to the stories, had been worse off than he was when they started. The star pupil, Romano Stanislaw Pusilaus, was flat on his back when he started the Konex system. And now look at him. What a film. Like some of those guys in mythology stuff. He fingered his upper lip tentatively as he admired Stanislaw Pusilaus' pencil line mustache. Well, maybe that'd have to wait. But the rest of it, Wow. Professor Konak's euphonious literature was so stimulating that he wasn't even despondent that the price of the course was $35. He had $10. Only 25 bucks between the body he had and having a body like Stanislaw Fuselaus's. 
he would figure out about raising the money somehow. The one bright thought he had concerning this problem came to him that afternoon. His saxophone. He got it last Christmas, and he wasn't exactly amazing his friends with it, as he'd anticipated. Maybe he could pawn it or sell it or something. But uh, would his old man be sore if he found out? Boy, yes. He was going to have to think of something less risky. He couldn't sell that sax. A week later, his optimism was as well worn as the professor's pamphlet. The money problem remained unsolved, and he was on the verge of hopeless despondency when he received another rallying communication from the big-hearted Konak, who, in order to encourage young men to super strength and health during the invigorating summer months, was reducing the price of the course from 35 to $10 for the month of July only. Enroll now! That man, Konak, what a hell, what a friend, a heart of gold that man had. He had selected from his files the names of a few ambitious young men to whom he was going to give away a special intensified course for $10. The only string attached to this charity was that the lucky fellows, after acquiring their muscles, would agree to make themselves available for exhibition purposes. Wow! If he acted today, the famous Konak muscle molder exerciser would be included at no extra cost. Creeper. Just think of us being exhibited. Maybe Konak would print his picture in the brown tone booklet. They'd probably want him to pose holding a javelin or a discus or an anvil or something like that. Uh, maybe they'd pose him as the thinker. Boy, brains and brawn. Wait until Isabel Kinston saw him out in the backyard taking a sun bath in one of those leopard skin outfits. He'd be like a sun god. Boy, yes. <laughs> Ten days of agonized waiting followed. What about this guy, Konak? Now that he had the ten bucks, was he going to run out in the deal? Did Konak think a summer vacation lasted all year? What good would muscles be in the wintertime if you wanted to run around one of those leopard skin things to show off a little, huh? And then it came. At first, the contents of the big envelope took the edge off his enthusiasm. The intensified course consisted in the main of six badly blurred mimeograph sheets, describing a series of motions to be done with the muscle molder exerciser, each exercise illustrated by a muscle-bound sketch that only added to the confusion. Also, there was a separate green sheet with training rules on it. How to eat, how to sleep, how not to smoke while you were in training. Oh, well, that wouldn't be too hard. So far in his life, he'd smoked one cigarette and a half. He perused the course several times, hoping that he'd skipped over some thrillingly magic formula. But none came to light. The secret of the thing must lie in simplicity and the muscle motor exerciser, which he fully understood would cost eight ninety eight if purchased without the course. But where was the thing? He couldn't understand why they had to hold back and send it under a separate cover. The package came the next morning. He opened the pretty small box for eight ninety eight's worth. The mighty muscle motor exerciser turned out to be two wooden handles set in heavy wire frames with loops so that the five elastic cables could be fastened to them with the spring snaps. Boy, this is going to be a cinch. Just stretch these cables every day. That was all there was to it. With five cables, it ought to be easy. The guys in the illustrations looked to be stretching about 30. He attached all the cables to the handles and set himself for the first exercise. He couldn't budge the thing. He took off a cable. No better. He removed another. What a business. He got onto one cable. He could move that five times. The instructions called for ten times. Creepers. He felt sick. What a shape he was in. He read the pep talk in the green sheet, which repeatedly mentioned perseverance. He took hold of the exerciser and persevered through the whole routine on one cable. And when he got through, he could feel his muscles swelling. Yummy. Just to be sure he couldn't miss, 
He did the entire routine three times a day instead of once, as the instructions said. He made wonderful progress. By the end of the week, he could move the cable ten times at all the exercises. And except for feeling sore and tired all the time, he never felt more magnetic in all his life. At the end of the second week, he rolled the short sleeves of his sport shirt up to his shoulders and took a walk to the People's Saving Bank to get weighed. He certainly must have put on several pounds for this time. He uh, hadn't exactly expected to create a sensation on the street, but somebody, some girl, should have given him at least a second look. He, he stepped confidently on the scales. He read the dial. He stepped off. <laughs> the scales must be stuck. <laughs> Why didn't they take care of these things? What kind of a bank were they running? He stepped back in the scales, real hard. He read the dial. He'd lost two pounds. Impossible. He didn't have that much to lose. He wasn't whipped yet, by golly. He went home and read the pep talk in the green sheet again. He decided to give the old cable a rest and use a new one. What a blow. He could move the new cable only five times. He hadn't been getting stronger. The first cable had been getting weaker. He felt like crying. He read the pep talk again, slowly this time. He would just have to work harder. That was all. following weeks were an elastic nightmare. He pulled cables in his dreams at night and then got up and stretched them all day long. He was so tired all the time that he had energy enough for only one good daydream. It was about how he got satisfaction from Murph Muller, the star center, for insulting Isabel Kinston in a public place at the soda fountain. They had to call in Big Mike, the butcher, to help hold him off Murph when he made that remark to Isabel. Afterward, he was glad he hadn't got to Murph when his temper was up. It might have been serious for Murph. But he had demanded public satisfaction in the ring under the Marcus of Queensbury rules. He hired the National Auditorium for the purpose, and the event was a sellout. Thousands of people. They even took in the SRO sign. Boy, did that crowd roar approval when it was announced that the proceeds would go to the community chest. What a night! And when he walked in purple bathrobe and orange trunks down the aisle to the ring from the dressing room. That crowd, man, old man, that crowd, every man, woman, and child, a raging maniac. He shook hands with the crowd, did a snappy shovel in the rosin box, took a few warm-up exercises on the ropes in his corner, and then the attendants had to go around and take the slack out of the ropes. What a man! And then, when the bell rang, he turned chicken. He couldn't do it. He didn't give the crowd its money's worth, really, but they loved him just the same. He humanely disposed of Murph early in the first round with a lightning sledgehammer left to the button that traveled only about an inch. And then, as the referee raised his mighty arm in victory, he looked down over the ropes to the ringside seats and saw Isabel in her yellow sweater. She was cheering him and melting him with her blue eyes. What that girl did to a yellow sweater. Wow! There came a morning when he just didn't feel like getting up. He stayed in bed past breakfast, and his mother got worried about him and got him up at noon and took him to the doctor's. What a life. The doctor couldn't find a thing wrong with him except that he seemed terribly run down. He's been working and playing too hard in the summer heat. Now give the boy a chance. Don't push him. Let him loaf for the rest of the summer and he'll snap out of it. His mother spluttered. But, but, doctor, push him? Why, we haven't asked him to do a thing all summer. He spent most of his time moping around the house. The doctor looked at his mother as if he thought she lied. Now, some parents get too enthusiastic about summer jobs for their boys. It doesn't always pay. Well, he and his mother left the doctor's office. She was somewhat puzzled, but also relieved. When he got home and flopped down in his bed with the new unbelievable stories, the bitterness of his defeat almost gagged him. Creepers. Where were his muscles, his magnetism, 
his dream, his ten bucks. Do you look like this? Yes, worse. Talking to Coach Connor, man to man. Yeah. Snapping chains and tearing cards and phone books and bending spikes for the amusement and amazement of his friends. Yeah. Walking down the street with a body like Romano Stanistar Pusilaus's with a girl in each arm to bring Isabel to her senses. Yeah. What a letdown. What a bust. That faker Konak, he can help you. Yeah. He had to cry. He couldn't help it. He pulled himself together after a while and opened his new magazine. A big blue advertisement hit him off the inside cover. Learn hypnotism. Profitable. Entertaining. Success in love. Business. Mysterious oriental secrets unfolded. Well, what about that now? And only two ninety-eight for the big illustrated book, thoroughly covering every phase of the subject. He got off the bed and stared himself in the eye in the mirror. Wow, those eyes of his! Maybe he had something there. He didn't feel sick and hopeless anymore. He was feeling swell. Why not take in a show tonight? Why not be dominant, masterful, dynamic? Why not? He would see Isabel at the show. He would blink at her once, and she would sag right toward him, right in his arms. Would that be impressive? Creeper. You have just heard J. Roger Weitzel's short story, Miracle Man. Say, I enjoyed that very much, Nelson. And I'm afraid I'll have to admit that it reminded me of myself. The author certainly has an understanding for adolescence. <laughs> yes, you. And uh, you may be surprised to know that this is one of the first short stories Mr. Weitzel ever wrote. Well, I hope you'll write some more. Now, what about our show for next week? Well, you we'll move to a new evening and a new time. I hope our listeners will check their radio columns and their papers and plan to be with us. Who's the author for next week? Please? One of America's finest writers, Hugh, Irvin S. Cobb. Oh, we're going to have another comedy. No. For although Irvin S. Cobb is probably best known as a writer of humor, he also was a master of suspense. And this story I plan to tell you, in my opinion, is one of his best. It's entitled, The Escape of Mr. Trim. And it's about an arrogant banker who gets caught trying to embezzle a great deal of money. After the trial, he's handcuffed and turned over to a deputy to be taken to prison. And then he escapes, is that it? Well, you, I'd rather you hear the story of Mr. Cobb wrote it. In a way, he does escape. But in another rather terrible way, he doesn't. It's a great story of suspense, and I think it'll keep you on the edge of your chair every minute. So try to be with us next week. This is Nelson Olmsted saying good night. And good reading. The National Broadcasting Company has presented Story for Tonight, featuring your teller of tales, Nelson Olmsted, under the direction of Norman Felton. The orchestra was conducted by Joseph Felicio with original music composed by Richard Shaw. Hugh Downs speaking. Next week, don't miss the gripping story by Irvin S. Cobb, entitled The Escape of Mr. Trim, on Story for Tonight. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.